in just a bit, uh, I'll tell you where we're going to turn uh, with regard to our study. This is part number nine of the heavens, uh, but we're going to take another short little rabbit's trail uh, on this uh, as to explanation of that. So let's again just quickly look to the Lord in a word of prayer and then we'll begin our study. Um, hang on one second, make sure that I... Oh, okay. Our Heavenly Father, we're uh, indeed grateful to be able to study your word today. May God the Holy Spirit do his office work. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, one of the first things we're going to do is just simply remind you uh, that this is number nine in a study on the three heavens. Uh, and we've been uh, going back and forth with a, a lot of different things. And I think um, what I'm going to do is, the first of all, with my overhead, pay back Patty Qualls for what she did this morning, having us carry in all those hot dogs. There were at least three tons of them, and we put in a whole day work, day's work. So on the overhead, uh, I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> I was not going to do it, but since she, honestly, it just uh, it was coordinated. It was providential. <laughs> So, <laughs> we'll, we'll go back now to regular programming. But last, last week, you know what, pastors sometimes have weeks where um, they are, as they say, from hell and, and there are difficulties, especially with regard to people. Sometimes even, you know, even your own people um, that, that have come under the influence of other ministries and begin to propagate that stuff in the church. You know, it's out there. We can't deny it. There's so much rhetoric with regard to, uh, to religion and, and viewpoints and doctrines and that sort of thing uh, and <clears throat> that you begin to struggle. And uh, that past week, I had uh, I had several struggles with regard to to America and and other churches and people, as Jackie said, people who used to come here, some who would be here, but because of health couldn't, but have others to uh, attend other uh, churches. Okay, now we're in America, and we believe that other churches have a right to exist. We'll just put. Uh, denominations over here okay we believe they have a right to exist we're this is free uh, country you have a right to choose as they say whatever church you want to biblically they don't have a right to exist if they're not Pauline then what are they what are they doing preaching a gospel that is contrary to his when Paul says to Timothy, teach them to teach no other doctrine, uh, to mark them which, uh, which uh, oppose the doctrine you've learned and avoid them, how can somebody who is a grace believer sanction somebody else going to one of these churches? And uh, we had a go around with regard to th this lady whose son was dragged into a denominational church uh, that go goes through all the things we stand against here. And because of his wife, and uh, then it was, uh, well, at this church, they teach how to live. And I said, okay, and, and this is what made this person upset. And you, you, I'm not going to give the name, but you would be surprised. I said, if they teach baptism, and God says we're not supposed to baptize in this, uh, in this dispensation, are they living right? If they teach tithing, and Paul does not teach tithing in this dispensation, are they living right? If Paul teaches male headship in the home, and it was the wife who put a, a ring in her husband's nose and says, you go here, you're going to have marital problems, do they have a right marriage? I mean, on and on we could go with these questions. Finally, after I asked about 10 of them, I said, Pastor, I'm, I'm getting upset over this, so we, we better stop talking. I said, that's fine. But, but the, the question was, this guy's, this son is teaching in this denominational church, doesn't know straight, he should not be a teacher of the Word of God. He is not a pastor teacher, never had any training. And he, he goes and he, he's been asked to be a teacher, you know, the, 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 um, the uh, uh, baptismal denominations, win them, wet them, and work them is, is the, the idea, their philosophy. And I've been there and done that, you're not going to tell me anything about them. But, but he goes and he calls mama up, ask Pastor Denny what this is. 
Now, he doesn't, get, he doesn't attend here. He doesn't bring his wife here. He doesn't bring anybody else here. He doesn't give a, he doesn't give a dime here, he, a penny. And yet he wants the, the benefit of our work, our struggles here, our standing for the grace message, and that's when that's when I got a little enough's enough. You and you all know I've been I've been a little more aggressive on this business. Is he grace or not? Well, they teach grace there, and I said, oh, they do. They do not. Now they might teach Paul's gospel uh, without works, but they're not grace believers. And I, I got all this list of things. You know, the the Baptist bride, uh, uh, the Great Commission for Israel, uh, uh, under a covenant, and on and on we go. And and. What happened was this woman was confronted with the fact that her son may be a believer, but he's not a grace believer. Her son may, may be going to a church, but it's not the right church, and he's compromised for the marriage. And they're trying to say that the marriage is right and the person is right and everything's okay. And I say, and I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not afraid to tell you, if it's not rightly dividing the word of truth, if it's not Paul's gospel, if it's not Pauline truth, if it's not the specific way God looks at it for this dispensation, I don't care if they go to church. They're sinning as they go. Uh, now that's, that's my official stand because uh, when we went through this, um, uh, uh, Joe Williamson had the question, well, do, uh, what about all these denominations and, and so forth? When Paul founded churches, did he find, uh, did he found, uh, you know, Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Baptist, uh, Episcopalian, uh, this, that, and the other? He did not. The only churches Paul, the grace apostle, founded were grace churches. And if, and if you can prove me wrong, I'll gladly entertain any thoughts that you, uh, that you might have and be a good Berean and search it out. But the fact of the matter is, this is something we've already searched out. If you've already searched it out so thoroughly uh, that, that, uh, that you've covered pretty much all the bases, what do these people need to do? They need to shut down their denominations and become grace churches or leave, uh, mark them and avoid them. Leave those churches and be a part of a grace church. Now, part of that was with regard to the struggle of even even some of you here and we could name the ministries that that you've listened to and you've supported who are constantly wanting to make the United States of America a covenant nation or a Christian nation I want to explain we want to evangelize America and make Christians out of Americans hey that that is Paul's program the calling out of, of believers from the nations of the world. But the minute you take Israel's covenant relationship with God and try to legislate that uh, through the government of any nation, whether it's America, Canada, Mexico, or, or the like, you're treading on very dangerous ground. Why? Because commandment number one says you have no other gods. In Israel, if you brought other gods there, you see, you see, you couldn't go to any church but God's church for Israel. If you established another church, uh, that was a false church. If you taught doctrine contrary, you were a false prophet and you were killed. If you tried to take over the Levitical priesthood, they slit your throat, burn you at the stake, stone you. You were dead. You had no options under Israel's program. In the future, it's going to be the same thing. It's a rod of iron rule. And so what you do is you take away something that America does have that is part of God's program for this dispensation, freedom of volition. And when you establish a state church, when you have government picking a church for you to go to and taking away your freedom and its majority rules, what if it's the majority of Muslims? What if it's the majority of Buddhists? Then, then I'm going to get my gun. I probably won't last very long, but I'll fight for freedom, for that kind of freedom, uh, uh, and, and so forth. That's the kind of freedom we have, and that's what makes America great. Now, we, just, we agree that these churches have a right to exist. We would never hurt somebody from another church. Never. However, biblically speaking, they do not have a right to exist unless they align with the teaching God has for today. And that's what, that's what got me a little riled. And, and I've been known at times 
to have somebody to row me, and, and it just, uh, it's that in me that wants to get out and explain this. But the problem is, uh, half the time, the, the people that row me aren't here or don't come back or whatever, to allow me the time to develop it. Now, that's what we do, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Jack hit on it here, uh, with regard to a frame of reference. And if you attend a church where all you get is three little points, a couple scriptures taken out of context, uh, three little points and a poem, and then uh, a poem, and then come, come, you know, and, and all this, all this uh, psychological business and emotional business to get you to make some sort of decision for Christ. You are never going to mature. You're never going to be what God wants you to be. You're always going to be legalistic like this church just down the way. But, but what you need is a frame of reference. And what does that mean? It means just like at school. Yes, there are sicknesses. Yes, there are vacations. Yes, there are bona fide times to miss. But you, you build doctrine upon doctrine upon doctrine upon doctrine so that by the time you get to the more advanced stuff, you have a frame of reference for what this guy's talking about. But religion wants sermons and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and that's something I gave up long time ago. I'm not going to sermonize. I, I might, I might stomp, get on a soapbox and preach at you just a little bit, but I will always get back to what I'm called to do. And that's establishing your mind a frame of reference to learn advanced doctrine. That is God's will for this dispensation. And those churches don't have it. And they have a, they have a wrong foundation. They have a wrong premise for their existence. Yes, they might name the name of Christ. Yes, they might mention that of grace. But they preach Christ after the flesh, and they redefine grace rather than going to the Apostle Paul. Now, what we're going to do is, is be, begin very slowly to remind everybody just once again what God's programs are. All right? One is the mystery program. The other is a prophecy program. Most denominations today, most Christians today, do not understand that God has more than one objective in the Bible, and more than one program. Um, I had, had someone just recently say to me, you know, nobody's, nobody that, that I'm aware of is telling us about the second heaven and being seated there with Christ. And I said, that's true. Everybody's focus is establishing the kingdom on earth. But you know what? That's not our program. Uh, I, I heard somebody today, uh, uh, this morning, I wanted to get my blood a little riled again, get the bl blood flowing to my brain, and uh, they had on here the Christian Statesman of the Year, and some woman who said, we've, we've got to fight for our culture. I ask you the question, if everybody's out there is unsaved and rejects Paul's gospel and rejects Jesus Christ and the Word of God, how are you going to make it a Christian culture when they're not Christians? I mean, the Christian way of life is designed to be lived from the point of, of regeneration through the Holy Spirit outward with accurate doctrine. If you don't have those three things, how in the world are you going to have a righteous culture? That is impossible. But can you individually have a righteous culture? Yes, you can. Trust Christ as your Savior. Use the reckoning technique to get filled with the Spirit. Once you're filled with the Spirit, apply the doctrines you know to your life, where, whenever and wherever, and that will give you rewards before God. That's a life lived to the glory of Jesus Christ. No other culture, no other means, no other system is going to provide you that. It's an impossibility. So what you need to do is make, make a distinction between God's program on the earthly sphere, which is Israel's program. Now, it's not the Gentiles won't be saved, but they are saved in conjunction with their uh, connection with Israel. That's the gospel of the circumcision. Even Gentiles, before they could be saved, had to have this token on their body in order to join in Israel's program. But today it is the, the mystery in the gospel of the uncircumcision where God's not working with nations, but individuals out of nations to the, uh, uh, to the reconciling of the heavenly sphere. And by the way, that's what the cross is all about. Let's go to the book of Colossians. 
book of Colossians, a book, the book Clifford renamed two or three times, but we understood because we have done that ourselves. Colossians, Colossians, Colossians. <laughs> when it rains, I put on my Colossians. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just joking, just joking. Uh, verse number 20 in Colossians 1. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. See, part of the mystery, which the angels didn't know, whether fallen or faithful, part of the mystery which no man knew until Paul, uh, uh, and then, then the humanity of Christ revealing it to him, uh, is that the cross of Christ is not only there to reconcile men to God, but heaven back to earth. The entire universe has fallen. Job says the stars are not clean in his sight. And that means that there was a rebellion that involved the heavens and the earth. And, but God's first uh, uh, program, prophecy, uh, was pointed toward establishing his kingdom on earth where he would make a, a prime citizen of, of heaven a citizen of earth. That's Jesus Christ. I'm going to tabernacle among them. Uh, and the word was made flesh and did just that. But the program of the mystery is that he's going to take citizens of, of earth and make them citizens of heaven. In the book of uh, uh, Philippians, and we don't turn there, but uh, that's the polychuma metaphor, where, where Jesus Christ was made a citizen of Israel. But we're removed from citizenship uh, from America or, or any nation, and we're made citizens of the second heaven. And that's the polychuma metaphor in Philippians. But let's continue reading the rest of this. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether there are things in earth or things in heaven. The blood of the cross is the channel through which God brings together uh, both heavens and earth through redeemed people. Saved Jews on earth, saved uh, Gentiles and Jews who become neither uh, seated with Christ in the heavens. Okay, now. Let's take a quick look uh, at uh, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. The above illustration is the illustration that all people saw at the time of, of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his, and his ministry. Uh, everything led up, doctrine compounded upon doctrine, event upon event, dispensation upon dispensation, and it was all pushing toward the establishment of an earthly kingdom. No one knew about the mystery or the dispensation of grace. It's still hid in God. But now here's the thing we want to, to show because we're, we're going to um, get back to the heavens, but we're going to do so through Paul here. And it says, verse number 28, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come to you. Now, mind you, there were uh, two types of, of people in, in Israel with regard to the nation itself. Rulers and subjects. And in order for the kingdom to come, God had not only uh, uh, was to have the subjects or the people to believe, they also had to have the rulers to believe. In other words, it was not going to be a grassroots rebellion against the rulers in bringing in the kingdom. The rulers had to believe first and then lead the subjects to believe. Now the rulers of Israel were the Sanhedrin, vested in the high priest, other priests, the lawyers, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, and that sort of thing. And it's, it's a group called the Sanhedrin. They were the rulers of Israel. 
But now, when Christ came and said, I'm the Messiah, you're going to have to be subject to me, they rejected him and instigated the people to crucify him. He, they turned the subjects of Israel against their own king. So here's what Jesus said, and he was, he was saying it to, uh, to a group of them. If I uh, cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Casting out devils was one of the hallmark signs of Messiah and his followers because when Christ comes, all unclean spirits are going to be cast out of the land. Not America, the land of Israel. All false prophets are going to be cast out of the land. All idols are going to be smashed and, and burned. Now, if you come on down here, he says, verse 30, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. And it says, last part of verse 32, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world. Now let's go quickly to the dispensation of law or in the world to come. Note, it didn't say dispensation of grace. They didn't know about that. Now, we understand, having considered this before, what Jesus is talking about. Three things. John the Baptist here represented God the Father. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The three members of the Trinity. Jesus Christ here came and he represented God the Son. And it said, okay, Israel, We'll forgive you if you reject John the Baptist. Okay, Israel, we'll forgive you if you reject Jesus Christ. But God the Holy Spirit is going to come with such overwhelming power and evidence that these men are, are speaking, uh, their credentials are from God, that if you reject the Holy Spirit, you're, you're done. It won't be forgiven you. Three strikes and you are out. So you come here and here, here's the Holy Spirit as he is uh, seen. Uh, we'll put it up here. Uh, what, what, I didn't want the Holy Spirit. I wanted the, uh, the, the disciples, all right? Christ's disciples here on, on the day of Pentecost onward. They did these miracles. They spoke with tongues. Uh, they're they're uh, affecting their uh, global priesthood. They're going to begin carrying it out, but it had to start in Jerusalem, then Judea, and so forth. Uh, because unless you have the Jews first accepting their Messiah, you can't have a kingdom without bringing the king back. And if they don't want their king, he's not going to come back. You can't have a kingdom without a capital city, Jerusalem. And if the leaders of Jerusalem reject and cause the people to reject, you can't have a capital city. If the land of Israel is going to be that from which the law flows and kingdom reigns in all the earth, then unless it starts there first, that's why it had to start there. But it started with the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, with these signs and wonders that were predicted in, in uh, Isaiah and other prophets that the kingdom's going to come. When you see people that can do this, then you'll know that they have the power of the kingdom to come. All right, now, let's, um, let's go to the book of Luke, book of Luke, chapter 13. Now, that Paul was associated with the Sanhedrin is easy to prove, and we'll go there in just a little bit. But it's important to, to note this simply because the Apostle Paul is going to commit the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that, why is that so important to, to prove that Paul committed this sin? That he blasphemed the Holy Spirit along with the entire Sanhedrin? Well, it meant that he could not be saved under law. Once he committed that sin, he could not be saved. Once he committed that sin, if, it, if he were in the kingdom, you know what? He could not be saved. So the Apostle Paul is a man physically alive and cannot be saved. I have a question. In the future, will there be other people physically alive but having uh, it uh, uh, brought upon themselves an impossibility of their salvation. 
those who take the mark of the beast. They're physically alive, but if they have the mark of the beast, they can't get saved. Uh, it's, it's done. And see, that's, that's how God gets rid of the rulers of the people and the subjects. The, the uh, subjects are the, the remnant. Well, how are you going to disobey the rulers? All the rulers basically have 666 except for those who join the remnant or the, the subjects of the coming kingdom uh, of, of Jesus Christ. If they accept 666, they're disqualified to be rulers of Israel. And you don't have to obey them. As a matter of fact, from Deuteronomy 13, what do you do if somebody tells you to worship another god? What, what if the high priest of Israel says, this guy, Antichrist, is, is, is Jesus Christ, and you're to bow before him? What are you allowed to do to that high priest, if you can get away with it? And they will during the, during the tribulation. Kill him. Kill him. What do you do if mom and pop, brother, sister, husband, wife, tells you the very same thing? That's where those verses apply where it says, kill him. Get them out of the way. They can't be saved anyway, and all they're going to do is join the forces and ranks of Antichrist, which are going to try to annihilate the remnant, the true remnant, to keep the kingdom from coming on earth. Uh, and, and so these things you have to keep in mind. This, this means this, and this fits here, and this is in this picture of the puzzle. And these are not random verses to have some sort of, some sort of e emotional devotional out of. Uh, you, you know, to kill your brother. Nonsense. Uh, you can't go to those verses today and do that. We don't do that today. We don't suggest that we do that today. But in the tribulation period, if they've got the mark of the beast and you don't, they're fair game, just as you're fair game for them. It's a rush to the end to see if the remnant can be annihilated. That's why uh, when Satan uh, uh, comes down in the midst of the tribulation period, he's thrown out of heaven. He has three and a half years, and he is mad. Why? Because he knows he's got a short time to do it, and he can't seem to find these birds because God's hiding them in Petra and other places. Okay. Uh, so let's go on here to Luke 13. Now, even with, even with um, God's kingdom program, without grace here, and we're going to make a point of, about grace, it's very important to understanding Israel. Jesus, as verse 6 of Luke 13, spoke a parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in a vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. He said to the dresser of the vineyard, These three years I've come seeking fruit on the fig tree, but I've found none. It cumbers the ground let, uh, and uh, cut it down. Said, Lord, let it alone this year also till I dig about it and dung it. If it bear fruit, then well. If not, then cut it down. So, even without the dispensation of grace, there was still a one-year period from the point of the cross. And that's the significance of Father, forgive them, my, my people, for they know not what they do. Uh, and uh, if you were ignorant in killing somebody, it was reduced from murder to manslaughter. And you didn't have to be executed. You were punished, but you didn't have to be executed. If, however, you, it was proved that you were a murderer, then you would be executed or cut off from God's program. Now let's take a look one more time at the significance. Here is the vineyard. Okay, here are the stakes and the vines. The vines and the grapes indicate redemption. Uh, the blood of the grape. Uh, the blood of either uh, the animal sacrifices, which affected a temporary redemption, or the blood of Christ, a permanent redemption of the new covenant for Israel. It indicates a redeemed people. But these people couldn't totally be redeemed until something else happened. What was that? The fig tree produced fruit. Now I didn't talk about leaves. Can a fig tree symbolizing religion produce a whole lot of lush, green, big, broad leaves to cover us up and still not give us salvation. Yes. That's why Jesus Christ cursed the fig tree. He went into the very temple and said, you guys have made my father's house a den of thieves. 
Therefore, you're the fig tree and you've corrupted the, the true religion of God on this planet. What you need is fruit. Now, how long from the, from the point of the cross to the point where the fig tree was going to either have to bear fruit or, or be cut off? One year. All right, now let's, let's go here to, to uh, the book of Acts chapter 7. Uh, let, let's go to chapter 3 first, and, and then we'll go to chapter 7, and then our time is, is about up. But this is going to help us establish a time frame for the birthday of the body of Christ, how Paul got saved, why this is important, and why we cannot go back under Israel's program for, for any reason except as Paul allows us to go back, he does quote the Old uh, Testament so, and, and various things, except as Paul allows us to go back and claim these verses and Bible principles, other than that, we can't do it. All right, note what, what Peter says in giving Israel the benefit of the doubt. Acts chapter 3, verse 17. You've crucified him, uh, Christ. I know that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. Fig tree, vineyard, all right? What did he say on the day of Pentecost? Israel, you did it through ignorance. But you know the, those things at the Cracker Barrel, uh, they're little puzzle, peg puzzles where you put in, and, and uh, if you leave four, <laughs> they don't, <laughs> They say, they're not kind. You know, you, you missed it. Try again. They say, you're a big dummy or you're ignorant or oh, whatever it is, but it's something of that nature. So he said, okay, you did it. We're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And so for one year, the apostles began working with the nation of Israel to bring not just the people, but the rulers to repentance. They had a time limit. So let's go to Acts chapter 7. And the guy filled with the Holy Spirit, performing miracles, signs, and wonders, uh, showing that he was a kingdom representative, was Stephen, who made this statement at the end of his spiel. Verse 51. He's talking to the fig tree, flourishing with leaves, but no fruit, the fruit of faith in Christ their Messiah. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now, keep that in mind because in the next hour, we're going to look at being a true or completed Jew under law and what it means to be a Jew under grace. Uh, he says, they're, they're still in covenant relationship with God. You're uncircumcised in heart and ears, meaning they didn't want to hear it. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. Let me ask you a question. Do we just cover that someplace with regard to... What is it? The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. They rejected John the Baptist. They rejected Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, third strike, you're out. If you rulers and, and the people reject the Holy Ghost, then judge, you're, you can't be forgiven. And so that's what's happening here. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have your fathers uh, uh, not persecuted? They have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Now you're the murderers. In ignorance you did it, manslaughter. Now, now there's no excuse. We've worked and worked. You had a time limit. You're not, you're not uh, obeying God and you're cut off. And so, and so Israel was cut off. Now, who, <clears throat> And the leadership here especially. Who was involved with that leadership? Note verse number 58. They cast Stephen out of the city, stoned him, and, and, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. Now, Saul was a false witness. According to the law, if you bore false witness against somebody and it was found out, what was the punishment? Now, well, the very thing, if you were going to kill somebody or bore false witness, you wanted them dead. The very thing you wanted, or the, the very means you wanted them to die, you know, burning at the stake, being, uh, being hung on a tree, stoning, 
was the means you were to die. At, at that point, Saul was among this group. He saw, all, he, he knew what Jesus Christ taught. He knew where Israel was. He, he saw the miracles of Stephen, and yet he rejected and committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, what did that mean for Saul of Tarsus? He could not be saved, at least under the program of law or under the program of kingdom. He, Saul is not a law believer. Saul is not a kingdom believer. But did Saul get saved? Yes. But that's the story of the exceeding abundant grace of God. That where sin abounded, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, grace abounded more. And it spilled over and saved a man, Saul of Tarsus, who was still breathing out th uh, threatenings and slaughter against kingdom believers, the remnant a church at that time. But how did he get saved? He got saved by grace and not uh, by Israel's program.